Hello, I'm the Economancer, the High Priest of the Economicon. It is my job to give you lessons from the Economicon, to give you this broad, powerful Economancy so that you can use it in your day-to-day -day life and in conversations with those you do and don't like. The last episode, we had jumped into the davis more hypothesis of stratification. Now, I felt that this analysis didn't go deep enough into what is the davis more theory of stratification and how that works in society. So today we're going to be breaking down some of the words, going into that very briefly. This will be mostly a summation of some of the work that we had done prior in the last episode, maybe a bit of more of an explanatory explanation into it and then we're going to be moving more into Wilbert E. Moore who is kind of the the main propagator of this belief. So the first thing is we're talking about structural functionalism. I keep saying that but it just it just lands on false ears. So functionalism defines itself as everything has a function. I know Shakespeare couldn't have said it best. Um, and then stratification. So I, again, this is not something that I covered, but stratification is the difference. It's a range from the top to the bottom. Now, a lot of social theorists point to a range of power from the top to the bottom. I don't necessarily describe all levels of, you know, difference between the top and the bottom as different sets of power, but that's what most social theorists believe. Now, so let's kind of define this again. So functionalism and stratification. So how is stratification functional? Well, I've given you the idea about the difference between uh, the CEO and a fry cook. Why is there a difference? Well, it's a difference in, you know, human capital accumulation. It's a difference in, you know, to overall, you know, maybe work ethic, whatever you want to call it, however you want to define it, that there's a difference and it's there for a reason. And the main reason is that we can match jobs. So those who are doctors who spend anywhere from, you know, eight to 10 years in academia, in school, learning their trade versus, you know, let's take a plumber, for example, that can be a two year apprenticeship or a two year vocational school. The, the difference that you have there in overall accumulated human capital when they get out of their job is significant. And so we could say that the doctor deserves more money, which I don't like the word deserve because as Milton Friedman said, if we all got what we deserved, we would be dead. So, but it is kind of like, it, it matches what society needs more so. And it also matches the level of input to output ratio. Now, what does this do as a function of society for this job matching and like, how we structure society around it. Well, let's go back to the division of labor that we would that we had, you know, expanded on from uh, Adam Smith. This division of labor is functional to society. So we have a functional division of labor based on many different efforts. Now, this doesn't always work, right? So uh, obviously, we're going to have some some failures. This is going to be associated with nepotism, with corruption. And, and those are those are issues that you can bring about that happen in the system. But those don't necessarily disprove. They just say, well, we need more bulwark against these issues, which is very well maybe a true statement. So that's that's essentially what it is. It's looking at stratification and how it is functional to society, how we can utilize it, and what is the purpose of it. So now let's go into Wilbur e. Moore from the Davis Moore hypothesis. So first off, Kingsley Davis, uh, post hypothesis, he kind of left the realm of social dynamics uh, and social stratification, and he moved into population dynamics. He was probably the foremost expert in population dynamics. Um, he was accurate enough that in the 1960s, 1970s, he predicted and forecasted the world population within three months uh, of, of the expected goal. So he said in 2000, it would be, uh, I think it was like 7 billion. 
uh, and I think he was off by three months. I think it was like November 1999. So it was an amazing level of forecasting, um, especially given the lack of quantitative tools uh, available to him. Okay, so then we have Moore. Now, Moore stayed in this entrenched battle in the sociology uh, journals. Um, you know, he's refining his position uh, consistently, you know, trying to integrate uh, and compromise on some of this, but trying to get the bulk of uh, sociology to really understand what his position was, what it meant for society, and how we can utilize it in a scientific uh, framework, because he felt like this, the post, uh, the yeah, the neo-Marxist critical theorist, critical conflict theorists really missed the mark on the importance of quantitative work. And so that's what he's trying to point here. So the first part of this paper is compromise. The second part of this paper is a direct attack. So the first part, he goes, okay, so we have two theories. We have the relativistic theories and we have the global theories. Global theories are kind of the structural fun functional static theories that this is society input, input, output, change happens. All right, cool. Then he goes, then we have the relativistic theories that all change is unique. And he goes, okay, well, I'll concede that mine isn't great, but you have to concede that yours isn't great and that there's some middle ground that we can both use because we can identify sources. We can identify forms, directions, and rates of change in the different types and segments of social systems. And so we can build a model from that. Now, he points to, okay, so what are the critiques that I value or validate to static social structures? First is climatic trends. Okay, now this may sound wild but biology moves slower than uh social dynamics and so a constant cannot explain a variable that is dynamic in any set of system of logic the next one is purity of causal direction okay so you know correlations can be spurious as well as causality can be spurious now what does that mean um that means we're going to have possibilities of bi-directional causality. Um, so humans change an, an institution, right? And then an institution changes the humans and those feedback against each other. And so that's kind of the idea of, you know, this bi-directional causality that he's pointing to is like, okay, so I can see that it's not A causes B, but it's A causes B, but changes in B cause the changes in A and so on and so forth. So we can all agree that that's true and that's why we shouldn't have static theories. The third, uh, society and biology are fundamentally associated with the level of technology. So this is that Marxist materialist dialectic that says, you know, the, the differences in a lot of the outcomes can be associated with almost strictly the material differences between cultures, societies, and people. Now he says, this could be true or this is a valid critique of you know just static models but that doesn't mean that is always the defining class in any three of these the, okay we can't use static models so now we're going to move in the middle ground so he says all right so now we're, we're, we're going to try to leave behind these external sources of change and only going into the internal or endogenous change um, and he's saying that this does not help a the if a theorist, you know, clings to a single factor that we had said before about those three different types, because that doesn't answer all of the questions. It doesn't give us any level of primacy of source. And this becomes like a really powerful analytical critique. Um, and it's an important important part of work in like econometric theory that happens. And so it's how do we deal with the interdependence and looking at what is a leading variable? What is a lagging variable? How can we look at this? Now he pulls a lot of this from Sorokin, who is a Russian uh, sociologist who actually had a very strong influence on sociology at the time, trying to move towards a more quantitative uh, evaluation of society. And this is along the lines of the structural functionalists. They wanted to have a much better quantitative background in sociology rather than relying on 
the pretty words from a postmodernist, for lack of a better term. Um, now, as a brief aside, this is something Econometrics dealt with. Um, and this came through Sims in 1980, um, moving towards vector autoregressions, um, being able to identify, you know, the economic structure of like what is the most exogenous to least exogenous or this endogeneity or the movement of the variables, all different types of things that happen in the vector autoregression, which is pulled from, you know, the physical sciences and moved into there. And so... That's something that econometrics dealt with. Uh, and, you know, he's really giving a precursor to why we should move towards this. So you have to understand in this sociology battle, as much as we kind of want to make it the liberal versus the conservative or the progressive, what it really is, is saying there are people who believe in structures and the function of those structures. And then we have people who believe that all structures and functions are necessarily corrupt or necessarily bad or have problems. So this is that real, real deep philosophical divide here that's really getting brought out. This is something that Jordan Peterson has talked about on numerous occasions about the difference between conservatives and liberals about the idea of like walls or, you know, borders that conservatives want things bordered because they don't want the free spread of information or the free spread of disease or the free spread of all of these things because they can't, they can't hold on to it and not have it explode. And so he, this is kind of that same idea, whereas liberals, they want that free exchange of information, even if that could have a negative impact. So we as a society have to balance these two. All right. So then he moves into this argument that much of the field uh, has abandoned like the primacy of sources. And that means this favors the consequences of external events. So meaning that whatever changes, it's unpredicted and uncontrolled unless we have this external source that causes a shock to the equilibrium system that creates the change. So without that, we have no idea no idea how to identify on the internal structures of the initial events. And since we don't have some hidden knowledge and we can't actually identify it, then it's, it's just, it's not even worth having a conversation about, but he says, that's not true. We can have an analytical system and we can find sufficient patterns and we can make a generalization from those patterns. And by making a generalization, we're making a social science theory. And there we can test our hypothesis. We can test our theory empirically and come to some conclusion about the general trends. Now, we move into kind of some hypothesis theory building that he's moving into, which I think are very important because of these, these are motivating structures of ideas that have led to big changes in sociology and economics, uh, but it didn't always happen uniformly. So first is he posits this hypothesis that's, that'll later get picked up by uh, Seymour Lipset, that uh, rational technical orientation to the natural or social order, uh, that's an essentially an irreversible intellectual revolution. We can't backstep. We're moving forward now. This is the rate of change. This is where we're going. There's no reason to take a step back. Now, I see this as a very big critique of the postmodernists because the postmodernist, the post-structuralists and postmodernists really focus on a critique of enlightenment saying, oh, look, that is bad. They made these fundamental errors. And he says, guys, stop looking behind, move forward. You're wasting too much time on, you know, defining things in the modern versus, you know, the pre-modern. That's, that's not useful. Now, another thing about this is that he's also kind of signaling to what Lipset points out is that the economic structures or whatever you want to call it, whether it's the economic structure, whether it's the increased human capital, however you want to define it. At some point in time, because the division of labor becomes so broad, there actually becomes a necessity for society to democratize. Now, people will think this is crazy because you can have, you know, a society that doesn't democratize and is growing, 
But the problem is, is we don't know what level based on each individual country, society, culture becomes that breaking point where it moves from being controlled or into democratized. But what we do know is that at some point, because there's two reasons. One, um, you can't have a pure free market with all of the power coalescing to one individual because there would be conflict. So he, Lipset says, okay, I agree with the conflict theorists. There's going to be conflict if this inequality grows to the point of absurdity, right? We can all agree with that. And the next he points out is like, okay, as we've watched the West grow and other countries alongside it, the more it grows, it seems the more free it becomes. And that that is a function of this structure that is derived from the inequality. I know that's mind blowing, but there has to be a bigger emphasis on redistribution of resources because this division of labor becomes so broad that those on the bottom, they're going to need help because they're so vastly different than those at the top. So you have government redistribution to kind of make sure that there's not a revolution from those at the bottom. So now this is something the Marxists use to say, oh, capitalism has done these redistribution efforts just to keep the proletariat uh, uh, happy enough to continue with its hegemonic power structure. But Lipset says, no, 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 you don't get to use that argument because it's making the world a better place, regardless of what you may think. All right. So anyway, moving past that, the next, the next hypothesis or theory that he's going to try to build on is about the future consequences of fertility behavior and how that may exhibit a lack of labor supply and demand in the future. Um, now, no one really talked about this because everybody just assumed that population growth was constant or was, you know, we would be able to keep some level of population growth, whether if not in the West, we would be able to import it from, you know, other places. But what we're finding is those places are also having declining populations. Now, this is a rather new idea by how new, I mean, this paper was released in 2020. Uh, this comes from Charles Jones. This is the uh, the end of economic growth, question mark, the unintended consequences of a declining population. And he points to, okay, so we know that human capital is the driver of growth. What what allows human capital to happen? Well, obviously it's humans. So if you're having declining population growth, you're going to have a decline in human capital because it takes a certain level of people to be able to have knowledge to increase and grow and spill over. And once you're at declining levels of population, one, you have to maintain the level of technology that you have. So you have to have a certain level of maintenance population. Now, if we're declining, we might hit that level of just maintenance population. And then the next part is for there to be growth in human capital, there has to be more and more people. So more ideas are shared, more ideas coalesce into existence because there's just more people. And there's more touches and perspectives on each different level of technology that allow us to grow more. And so when we're having declining population, we're losing that. Now, you may think this is funny, but there's actually the Warhammer 40k series goes into this actually a lot. Um, it talks about how those in the 40k universe cannot maintain the level of technology that was from the golden age. Um, and that is not so much a function of population. It is a function of loss of human capital due to, you know, the, the warp and all of that. But I just think that that's funny because, I mean, that... That is resoundingly true, and it's something that he, you know, prophesized years and years ago, like one paragraph excerpt in a paper, and it got picked up in 2020, and it's now looking at like, hey, guys, no, there's a legitimate issue here in our population dynamics that we need to look at, um, which is funny because Kingsley Davis, the father of population dynamics, didn't really foresee much of this, but... I don't know that much about Kingsley Davis, to be honest. I didn't read a whole lot of his. I'm, I, I like Wilbert Moore, obviously. Um, the next thing is he's he's pointing at strain theory, right, which we've gone into general strain theory and stuff like that. And he's like, okay, that is a function of any competitive system. It's not a function of just capitalism. That's not a function of just, you know, the West. It's a function of any competitive system. 
Further, he attacks this proposition that a system attempting to maintain order and equity would would be not challenged. What he's saying, this would be challenged just as much as an unequal system, and that any claim otherwise comes from pure prejudice. Now, notice he actually says it comes from pure prejudice. He's saying, if you deny that this unequal system would necessarily involve itself in competition and that this equal system would not have competition anymore. Therefore, the strain only falls to the uh, on, on the unequal system. You're silly because there are multiple levels of stratification. We can equalize the economic. It might bring about changes in the social status. It might bring about changes in the political status. All of these different intersections are still going to be, you know, maximized just because, you know, once we lose one set of uh, stratifications, it's going to maximize some of the other sets. And so if you think that the conflict theory that you're proposing somehow goes away uh, because we're equalizing things, you're wrong. Also, he's saying, if you think that people aren't going to be mad because they're doctors and have spent eight to 10 years in college or some somehow have the same standard of living as those flipping burgers at McDonald's. If you think that is going to be better, you think that's going to be an okay system. You're crazy because these people are going to be just as mad. So you're going to have those at the top being just as mad in the reverse as those at the bottom. It's still going to cause conflict. So it's silly to say that you're, equity system is better in dealing with the conflict theory. It's just not true. Now, he goes into another criticism and he threw, and this is something that I think every researcher, every critic, every skeptic, every person should follow. Predominant institutionalization does not dispel or dismiss its counterparts. Just because it is the dominant thought in economics, in psychology, in whatever, does not mean it disproves the opposite. It does not mean that it has won every battle. It has beat every front against the opposing theory. That is just not true. When someone says um, it's settled science, just quote them that, uh, because that is just a bandwagon fallacy. It's a logical fallacy. There has to be some level of truth to all of the theories, or they wouldn't be considered tautologies uh, prior to empirical uh, persistence. And that's especially true in the social sciences um, that have very little in the way of direct experimental designs. Um, so, yeah, just because everyone in the sociology department at your university or any other university is a neo-Marxist uh, conflict or postmodern conflict theorist doesn't mean that that is inherently correct. It just means that they're the ones with the institutional power. Uh, next, this is where he gets into the methodology. Um, and this is what I was trying to get at with the last episode about, you know, you got Parsons, Friedman, Kuhn, Popper, Stigler, um, and then you also have more. These are guys that are trying to push this revolution of quantitative economics, quantitative sociology into academia and saying, okay, cool, you guys have a lot of these great theories. Let's test them. Let's put them through the numbers. And we've already kind of established that we can find general patterns in these social changes. We can find general patterns in, in how stratification happens in society, in between societies, and all of that. And we can test this quantitatively. Um, and, he, and so the first thing he points to is there's new innovations in fitting trends. Now, at the time, you know, the level of computational power is very small in comparison to nowadays. So He's saying, oh, we're already having these major breakthroughs and fitting trends. So it doesn't have to be just a linear trend anymore. We can have more robust nonlinear, nonparametric, uh, all of these regressions and tests. You know, uh, not too long after this, we move into what I consider like the uh, quantile regression. Um, 
revolution where it's just like, okay, that's what the mean says, but what, what happens in the rest of the distribution? Um, and so he's, he's saying like, yeah, there, there are ways that we can start testing this just because it's not linear. We have more, inf we can gather more information, more data, and then we can make more robust challenges to the hypothesis that y'all keep bringing up. Now, he also says like, this is this is a necessity because we have fluctuations as a nature of social dynamics um and that due to how we look at equilibrium models it, it may be difficult to define when and where social change happens um but by noting a shock to the system we can look at the impulses throughout the rest of the system and all the other categories and this may make determinism difficult to parse through but that does not say that the other side is correct because I can't define exactly the point of change and exactly what happens. What it says is, is that I can use these leads, lags, these new trends and, and these new trend fitting modes and all of this new econometric or psychometric uh, estimations looking at the leads and lags. And I can discover those general trends in social change. And that way we can test because that's what needs to happen. Okay. So what does this mean? All right. So first it means we have to understand that statics must precede dynamics and that dynamics produce statics. Boom. We have bi-directional causality in a system that is in equilibrium. All right, predator prey models and and you know in your differential equations class they go into this directly this is exactly what it looks like in the social system it's an equilibrium it has fluctuations it has changes but for the most part it's a system in in equilibrium and if there's a if there's a shock to it like some shock that happens to the static uh economy you know once it's applied to the system, the impulse carries through, you know, this can either be like a permanent or a transitory shock. So permanent, those are, those effects stay transitory. They can dissipate over time. And so this is really what he's pointing out. And you have to understand that this paper is quite old. This is, man years and years and years this is 1960 that's when this paper happened it's 1960 and it seems prophetic for what we're going through in social sciences now with the new quantitative versus qualitative revolution um as well as you know what are the arguments to be fighting against the neo-marxist conflict postmodern theorists well Honestly, it's trying to drive everything into the quantitative because they're going to necessarily struggle in the quantitative um, and not because they're dumb or anything like that, but because it's really hard to look at non-structural things quantitatively. And that's kind of what he's pointing at. He's like, hey, let's look at the structure. Let's look at the functions. Let's derive conclusions from there. We can look at yours once we do our analysis and find the general trends then you can have your day and say, well, this trend was this and this trend was that, fine. But until we find the general trends, you can't talk. You can't say anything. None of your points are valid. No more than mine are valid at this point because I don't have the ability to do it either. So stop yelling at me. <laughs> and, and I know that may sound crazy, but again, it goes back to that discussion that I had last episode, like, a lot of the criticisms just straight up said, you know, you're evil, you're a conservative, you want inequality, you'll do anything to maintain the power hegemon in society. Um, and there was very little empirical proof against them. Um, there was a few that tried like logical extensions as proofs, but it was just like, well, your logic doesn't go anywhere either. And that's what he was kind of referring to in this paper. So I hope this gives you an idea of what was going on in this paper. And 
what was going on with Wilbert E. Moore. So it gives you kind of his criticism of the way sociology is heading. It also gives you his criticism of some of some of the old stuff that was happening in sociology and how we can build upon it and be better through empiricism, through quantitative analytics, through finding better methodologies to understand these social dynamics, to understand structural change in societies, to understand stratification. Because again, we can all agree that stratification can have negatives. But that doesn't mean that everything associated with stratification is necessarily a negative. At some point in time, you have to ask yourself, is what I'm positing just becoming a scapegoat? Is what I'm positing just a function of you know, my own premonitions, um, you know, this is something people call the um, confession through projection, uh, or, and, and the reason why I say that is like, well, I, I feel superior to everybody, because if you don't know, the postmodernists come from a very elitist uh, way of thinking, and so they're like, well, I'm better than you, obviously, you're too stupid to know, so I should be the one in charge, and he's like, well, you know, that's kind of messed up. So you think that society isn't perfect because you're not perfect. You think society is controlled by elites because you're an elite and you think you're better than everyone. So you ought to get in control. And so when you put your mind to somebody else, that's what you conclude. So I hope that gives you a, a good understanding of that, uh, a good understanding of, you know, what's going on. Uh, the next step uh, is actually going to be taking a step back and going into Talcott Parsons. Um, and then I will probably be moving more into or moving back into inequality in society uh, by Manzan Sauder and going to the next uh, one. Uh, this one leads into, again, the next level. Once we've passed uh, Simone de Beauvoir, we're moving more and more into this postmodernist interpretation. Um, so I may take an episode to really parse out structuralism versus post-structuralism, modernity versus postmodernism. Um, I don't know yet. I don't know the level of, I don't want to assume any level of knowledge. Uh, if you, if you don't know a lot and you don't think that I should do a video, I would highly suggest going watching James Lindsay's work on it. Um, yeah, but other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day. Look forward to another video pretty soon. Bye.